good afternoon, everyone. Allison Scobberg here, Consolidated Planning Group, and we are partnering today uh, with the ARC of the Capital Area out of um, Austin, Texas. We've got uh, Caleb uh, Alfred with us here today. And so today um, we're going to be talking about uh, the, I call it a buzzword. Uh, we're going to be talking about Medicaid waivers, um, also known as interest lists, or are you on the list? Or that's kind of some of the things that people throw around on a pretty regular basis. Um, we're going from 12 to 1 today. Um, from a housekeeping perspective, um, we can't see you or hear you, but we do know you're out there and we're glad you're here. Um, we are going to be monitoring the chat box when Caleb is um, is speaking. I'll be monitoring the chat box for questions and I'll read those out to Caleb. He'll do the same uh, for me um, while I'm speaking. And if you're planning uh, your lunch hour, we are going to go from 12 to 1 today. So um, today's um, meeting is being recorded and following today's event, either today or tomorrow, you guys will get an email with anything we promised during the um, during the webinar, as well as a recording of today's um, uh, webinar, as well as a PDF of today's slides. So thanks so much for spending your lunch hour with us. And Caleb, I'm going to turn it over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Allison. Hi, yes, everyone. Welcome. My name is Caleb Alford. I'm the program manager of case management services at the Arc of the Capital Area here in Austin, Texas. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. We're excited to be with the Consolidated Planning Group today to talk about waivers. Um, I am, just so you know, I'm going to put in our chat box a survey that I'm going to ask for everyone to please, please fill out for us. Um, this survey allows the ARC to continue doing our outreach in the community. Um, it's how we continue to get our funding. So I would really appreciate it if you could take the time to fill it out today at some point before you're, um, we get off this call. Um, with this, once I get your email by submitting this survey, what I'm going to do is actually send you some very beneficial and helpful information that will cover waivers. Um, one in particular is a table that does a little snapshot of what we talk about today. It's a one page document that I think most people will find very beneficial when it comes to Medicaid waivers in Texas. So please fill that out. I'll get your email and then I'll send that hopefully for, to you all tomorrow. So, um, and that is in the chat box. If you don't find it, I'll send it again at the end. So again, my name is Caleb. I'm with the ARC. Um, I've been working at the ARC for about three and a half years. Um, I work in our non-waiver case management services, and I'm now the supervisor over that. Um, I've been working with the Medicaid waivers for quite a few years now, so I'm excited to talk with everyone more about them. So let's get started. So first, I'm going to bring up every, each one that is available here in Texas. So obviously, this is the Texas Medicaid home and community-based waivers. Um, these waivers include Community Living Assistance and Support Services, also known as CLASS, Death Blind with Multiple Disabilities, DBMD, Home and Community Based Services, HCS, Texas Home and Living, TXHML, Medically Dependent Children's Program, MDCP, STAR Plus Waiver, Youth Empowerment Services, also known as YES Waiver, and Community First Choice. So you will probably hear me go based off these acronyms for most of the rest of this. Perfect, Allison, you can go ahead and go to the next one. So now I'm going to break down up each waiver. In... Yes, it's perfect. That looks great. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to break down each waiver now for you all, and I'll expand on a few of these just so you can get some more info. So the first waiver that I'm going to talk about is CLASS, and this waiver gives um, home and community-based supports to children and adults with related conditions. There are about over 200 related conditions, such as cerebral palsy and spina bifida, to qualify. The related conditions must have occurred before the age uh, the child was age 22, and this is true because this means that that is considered a disability if it was done uh, happened before the age of 22. Um, CLASS is one of the waivers that does provide um, some more of the services compared to the rest. Um, CLASS, from what I've seen, is usually used for individuals who maybe live at home with their families but may have more medical needs or needs for um, unique types of therapy, such as equine therapy. Um, the ARC here in Austin is actually one of the largest class providers um, for this waiver in the uh, Central Texas area. Uh, we actually offer class services to the 17 counties surrounding Travis County. Um, like I said, I think we're actually one of the largest class providers in the state of Texas for the amount of clients we serve. So we definitely know a lot about class here at the ARC. And so if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, the next um, one we, I'm going to talk about is We have somebody in, in, the, um, in the chat box that kind of came to us. Um, are these waivers, so I know that today that the, the waivers that we're talking about are specifically for the state of Texas, um, but they're asking, are there similar, similar waivers in other states? Um, so it, would it be valuable for somebody that's from another state to, to, to be on to learn about waiver programs? 
So I, um, I actually looked up some waivers for another state earlier today for Georgia specifically. Um, from what I saw, just looking up Georgia's, they are different for at least Georgia compared to Texas. Um, from my understanding, each state does have waivers. So I definitely think you might find some beneficial information, but also know that each state's different when it comes to funding. So Texas specifically has one of the lowest funding rates for services such as this. So a lot of these wait lists are going to be a lot longer than what you might get in Minnesota. So I would definitely yeah, reach that's, out. To I was going to mention that for yeah. sure, that the waiting list are different in all states Definitely. and some states have some um, really awesome waivers that texas doesn't have but kind of getting a ge just a general idea of waivers and, and availability may be helpful to you and we'll have some other content on here as well so thank you for that totally. yeah perfect thank you for that question and just so you know my wi-fi is going in and out a little bit so you might hear me lightly just so y'all know um, so next one is um, DBMD, and which gives services for children and adults who are deaf, blind, or have a related condition that leads to deaf blindness and who, um, who have another disability. Um, I have not worked with this waiver as much, but this is an option for those who are considered deaf and blind with another disability. Um, the next one is home and community-based services, also known as HCS. In my field, we usually call this the golden ticket of waivers in Texas. It's one of the ones that offers the most support services. Um, this gives services and supports to children and adults with an IDD or a related condition who live with their families in their own homes or in small group homes with no more than four people. Um, HCS, like I said, we call it the golden ticket. Here in Texas, the wait list is about 15 to 20 years. Um, and a lot of these wait list times are dependent on if um, in, when, when our representatives are in session, if they decide to put money into these types of services. Uh, many years, Texas reps don't tend to put money in these services, and that is why our wait lists are so long. Um, from what I've heard, Texas is actually one of the worst when it comes to wait times. Um, we go back and forth with Mississippi for worse funding and wait times in this country. Um, so yeah, so that's specifically for HCS, it could take 14, 15, 20 years for that. Yeah, I was um, going to say, I, next... that's a common question that we get, Caleb, is basically, how long does that look like um, for the state of Texas? And, you know, when right. when uh, several years ago, we were hearing 10 years, and then a few years ago, the lists were frozen. Mm -hmm. And so more recently, I would say, um, you know, for the work that we do, we work with special needs families all day, every day, I would say 14 to 17 years, you said up to 20. Um, so I think it depends. But the bottom line is, it's a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So get on it as soon as you can. Definitely. It's a long wait. Um, and so we'll go over other ways to maybe skip the wait list later on in the slideshow as well. So that is specifically for HCS. Another one is Medically Dependent Children's Program, or MDCP, which gives services to children and adults who are 20 years and younger who are medically fragile as an alternative to receiving services in a nursing facility. Um, so they do have to have medical needs to qualify for that and be under the age of 20. Okay, next slide. And I apologize if I go through these quickly. Um, I know we don't have. I, I want I want you to talk a little bit more about the MDCP and the yeah. um like as far as like really what what you know what does this medically fragile mean um, when they're talking about MDCP because there is some confusion out there on that. From what I've heard, and so I've worked with this one probably the least amount. Um, I, from my understanding is I have heard of individuals who maybe have cancer who are having cancer treatments who may qualify for this and are under the age of twenty. Um, who need more um, supports and don't want to end up in a nursing facility. I've heard of individuals getting on it that way. Allison, have you heard any other? Yes, um, I've heard of um, G tubes and um, trachs and um, ventilators and you know other kind of like machine run uh, equipment that is necessary for the child. I, I think that that was. I think those are the easiest routes um, that I've heard. Yeah. Um, but yes, I mean I think that there's a lot of different. Um, different things out there, but but a kid that basically has autism is not going to fall under that medically fragile if they don't have a whole bunch of other underlying um, you know conditions uh, and, and such. And if there's somebody, I mean, a lot of times we have um, um, people from other organizations and professionals that work with this as well. So if we have anybody um, in the group today or um, that um, has any more details on the MDCP as it relates to the you know, how, how do you prove, you know, a fragile, a fragile loved one? Um, please feel free to put that in the chat and share. Yes, please. And yeah, just like, as you can tell, a lot of these waivers, there are a lot of options and some are utilized more than others, just because more people qualify for more than others. So that's why I'm more familiar with HCS class and text home and living due to that, and maybe even start class as well. And I, I think I think it's important um, for us to talk about Caleb that you know these waivers are designed to waive off, 
you know, the, the basically some of the cost of care and some of the cost of therapies and things like that. And the whole point behind these waivers is not to institutionalize. It's for your loved one to be able to get services in a home or community-based setting. And we're going to talk more about that because sometimes people are asking, what is the point of these waivers to begin with? We had somebody in the chat box says, uh, that says, is there a particular waiver that's better for Down syndrome? Um, it depends, obviously, if they have more medical needs, like if, like she was saying earlier, if they have a G-tube or anything. From the clients I've worked with directly, they usually would go under class, um, HCS, Texas Home and Living, or Star Plus, or the four I've seen them apply for the most, um, just because they will cover more of their needs. Most of the kids, adults that I've worked with who have Down syndrome, a lot of times will have HCS because they get a lot of home and community-based supports. And I know, um, at least for that diagnosis, a lot of our clients really want to be out in the community and day programs. And HCS specifically will cover four to five days a week in day have for the individual. So it will allow them to be out in the community and not institutionalize like Allison had stated earlier. That is an old school way of thinking. We used to kind of think of that was the way everyone needed to go to a state sport living center or something similar. Now we have kind of moving more towards community-based services to get them out in the community to thrive. So I would definitely recommend HCS, Tex Home Living, Star Plus, or Class. Also, um, depending on the waiver, I mean, oftentimes it's which, whichever list you come up on and what you get is what you get. Yeah, and sometimes exactly. you may come up on one and it may have a smaller budget than the other one, but in a few years you might be able to convert to another one. So it's not necessarily a picking thing, like you get to pick which one you get. It depends on when you come up on the list. And so, like I said, you might be able to upgrade um, up, up, upgrade later to a, a, a to a waiver that has a bigger budget for things that you might need. Exactly. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, that's totally true. So you can only be on one Medicaid waiver at a time. It almost almost like a step process. I've seen people maybe they start off in general revenue with their local authority, then they either get Star Plus or Texas Home and Living while they wait for HCS or class. Then maybe they get called up for class next. They're on class. And then eventually they called it for HCS because maybe class doesn't offer everything they need. So then they switch to HCS and that's what they stick with for the rest of their life. So that's a great thing. Thank you, Allison. Um, so the rest of the ones that we're going to talk about are Star Plus, Home and Community Based Services, HCBS, which gives services to adults over the age of 21 to keep them in the community and not in a nursing home facility. Um, we also have Texas Home and Living, which you've heard me refer to a few times already, which gives services to children and adults with an intellectual disability or related condition who live in their own home or their family's home. Um, I forgot to mention this on the last slide, HCS and Texas Home and Living, I know, um, both give some funds for dental. I know HCS gives about $2,000 a year in dental, and I believe Texas Home and Living gives about $1,000 a year in dental. And this is yearly, so I've had some clients who maybe get dental stuff done in the end of the year, and then they get that use that full amount, and then they wait and finish it in January and use the new amount to finalize what they may need done in their mouth. Um, so that's for Texas Home and Living and HCS. Um, also, we have the Youth Empowerment Services, also I've heard as called uh, the YES Waiver, and this is a 1915C Medicaid program that gives home and community-based services to children under the age of 19 with serious mental, emotional, and behavioral difficulties. Um, I've actually had a few clients. We have a juvenile program here, and um, our local authority in Austin is Integral Care. Um, they offer the YES Waiver in the mental health side of supports. And I have individual children who have an IDD diagnosis, but maybe are dealing more with the mental health side. And so Yes Waiver has allowed for them to get intensive case management services, lots of wraparound support. It is an intense program, but it really does help them get the supports they need in the community to be successful and finish high school or, and graduate. And Caleb, I just wanted to chime in on this one. In most counties across the state of Texas, there's not a waiting list for the Yes Waiver. So that's a different okay. thing. And also on the YES waiver, it's not based off of parental income as far as Medicaid um, qualification. Um, with the YES waiver, the kids do get Medicaid. Um, the YES waiver usually runs about a year. It can be extended. And I've seen it extended as much as three years, um, but it, it's, it's, the, it's supposed to be about a year. But, but so don't be discouraged. And, and, I, and I take a moment to pause on this one because a lot of families are dealing with a lot of mental health, mm -hmm. um, you know, stuff on steroids since the pandemic and online learning and all these other moving parts that we've been dealing with for the last two years. Right. And I always say, think about alphabet soup. Um, if, if your kid is a good fit for the yes waiver, um, all of the ADD, ADHD, mm -hmm. ODD, BPD, like all of these little acronyms that they throw around, you know, like the, 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 the initials of mental health stuff, 
um, are a good choice. If your child has been a runaway, if they have a history of self-harm, if they've been in trouble at school or in trouble with the law, these are all um, examples of kids that might um, really benefit from this program. But I think it is important to note that the the primary issues need to be more on the mental health side. So if the if the initial issue is intellectual disability with an IQ below 70 or you know, low functioning autism and they don't speak, they're probably not going to be a good fit for this waiver. They probably won't be approved for it, but it, it, it's more on the mental health side. But I just like to talk about this because I think a lot of families do need help. There's a lot of wraparound services, like he was talking about earlier, different various types of therapies, equine, art, music. Uh, there's a bunch of different um, things in there that could be helpful. So sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, but I, I think that this is That's the great best kept secret of the waivers in the state of Texas that most people don't know about. Totally true. Yes. And, and also, yes, waiver is cool too, because I've had clients who get rec therapy through it, music therapy, like she stated. So it really can offer a lot. I know for Travis County, I do believe there is a wait list for our local authority. So it kind of just depends on what county you're in, um, but it is great. And it's definitely not as long as any of the rest of them um, due to it being on the mental health side usually. But she is right. It is usually for children who they can have comorbidities, so they can have IDD and mental health, but that mental health has to be the primary reason that they're needing those services. It can't be the IDD side. So, yeah, so that's for yes. And I just wanted to um, um, mention here that we had Shelly Bailey that um, put uh, some details. So if somebody was wondering more about the MDCP, thanks, Shelly, for putting that in there. We appreciate that. Thank you, um, so some more of the details on that. So thank you. Qualify. Yes, thank you for that. We appreciate it. Um, the last thing I was going to touch on was community first choice, which allows states to provide home and community based attendant services and supports to Medicaid recipients with disabilities help with activities of daily living and health related tasks through hands on assistance and supervision or queuing. Um, it's community first choice and I can't see the last part of it, but that's okay. Um, community first choice is in the Medicaid entitlement. And so that's this is entitlement for anyone in Texas who has Medicaid and all the rest of the waivers we just spoke about, I think except for maybe yes waiver, use CFC hours for attendant care. So if you have HCS, they pair it with CFC for attendant care. Star plus CFC. Texas Home Living uses CFC hours as well. So that's the Medicaid entitlement that comes with it. And I know Allison touched on earlier, the reason why these are called waivers is because they are waiving the normal requirements to qualify for Medicaid. And that's why, like she stated, that you may not always, it won't always look at the parent's income when qualifying for these waivers. Um, something else I think that we're gonna touch on later is that you'll see that the individual child or whoever's on these wait lists doesn't actually have to have their diagnosis official until their name is called up to the top of the wait list to receive those services. That's when they have to have the documentation showing yes, or get an eval done to prove that they do have IDD to qualify. So. Um, we had a question on the yes waiver um, on whether or not um, if a, a child is hospitalized for mental health needs, does the yes waiver assist with the cost of care facilities? And um, in general, um, we'd have to go deeper on this one, but in general, the, the yes waiver is for outpatient services, non-residential services. The yes waiver is designed uh, to prevent, to help um, aid the family in preventing needing residential care. Okay, that that's the design of the yes waiver, and um, there are some, um, you know, there are some respite. There are very few. There are some respite days. There are some other, you know, few things that you can do with the yes waiver, but it is it is not really for um, for hospitalization or residential. I don't know about the hospitalization, but I would say that I know for sure that the yes waiver is supposed to be outpatient. That's the goal um, for the for the entire. Yeah. Um, uh, for the entire waiver. And yes, everybody today is going to get a copy of today's slides and the recording. You guys are asking some good questions. Um, so thank you for that. And then we've also got some star plus. Um, Shelly Bailey's got um, to clarify is only for those over 21 on disabilities on the star plus. Let me have a look at that. Um, Yes, and I do believe too for Star Plus you can qualify if you're 61 or older as well without a disability, but it's for elderly people to qualify for it. And I think there might be one other stipulation with that too. So, um, okay, I did see too the comment that um, uh, they, someone asked about having a complete diagnosis. Is that for all waivers or a particular one? I believe it's for all waivers that require an intellectual uh, an IQ score of either 65 and below, or I think it's 70 
five and below with a qualifying disability. Is that correct, Allison? I think that's. I've, I've got I've got seventy, and and um, Shelley put sixty nine for the MDCP. So typically, what we've okay. heard is seventy and below, or seventy and seventy five and below with multiple with, disabilities. Right. Yes. So that's like gen, the general rule of 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 thumb for the for the IQ score, and and also. Um, and we're going to talk about this in just uh, a, a little bit that that um, your child may not have intellectual disabilities right now. Their IQ might be higher than 70 and you might think, well, forget it. So I shouldn't, um, you know, I shouldn't apply for anything. But we've seen where kids um, IQ scores change. We've seen that in autism in the in the greater the the late teenage years, the early 20s, where maybe a child that had autism was later diagnosed with schizophrenia and then IQ dropped and things like that. So, again, um, it doesn't hurt to have them on the list, you know, keep them on the list because you're going to prove that eligibility later. Um, once you come up mm -hmm. on the list. So don't wait until you think, oh, yes, I definitely qualify. There are some ifs and buts. There are some other reasons why you can qualify. And we're going to talk about those and crises and things like that. Definitely. And I wanted to say, too, I have, I know some people were saying that someone got denied with 70. That may be due to them not having a qualifying disability. I've had an individual get approved for HCS who had an IQ of 75, but had a cerebral palsy as a qualifying disability along with it. And so that was, a, they were able to qualify for HCS based off that. Um, and I did see something from Jana. She said about CFC. I believe that's true. Yeah, that not every child with Medicaid is going to qualify for CFC. They do have to have a level of care need to be eligible for that service as well. So thank you for saying that, Jana. I appreciate it. And we're going to be talking about the, um, the we were calling them Lida or Lida earlier, whoever yeah. knows, <laughs> um, the Local Intellectual Disability Authority. And we're going to talk about those and how you can find out who yours is. Um, if you want to, you know, they do IQ testing. Um, they will determine the overall level of need, um, also known as the LON. Um, and since we like to throw uh, acronyms around, they'll, they'll right. say, what is the LON? Um, but your local authority is going to um, talk to you about that. There's a lot of places you can get IQ testing. Usually a psychologist or psychiatrist office has a tester that they either refer to or one that's in their office. Um, sometimes that testing is provided by the district um, if that is in the, 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 the education plan, if it's needed. Um, sometimes it's provided by the district. I usually say, you know, um, you know, more likely through the local, um, the local intellectual disability authority is a good place to start. And of course, you can private pay and get this done. Um, it's not always that cheap. Definitely. Yes, that's right. And yeah, she said, so we'll have a uh, link for y'all to find your local authority too later on in the slides. Um, some, some, so some services that are available through all waivers include adaptive aids, financial management services, supported employment, employment assistance, minor home modifications and respite, um, services in all but MDCP and children's Medicaid, which um, is already, it already includes, are professional therapies such as OTPT, unlimited prescriptions, dental, and nursing. So these are all things that are offered except for those um, obvious uh, things that don't offer it. Um, so yeah, so I think then the table that I'll share with those who um, will fill out our survey today, I hope that y'all are able to access that. Um, that table is gonna show everything that each waiver covers. It will say if they cover OT or not, or specialized therapies, yes or no. It will say if you get nursing with it, what it will literally go through the whole thing and tell you, have a check, yes or no, if it's covered. So I think it will be very beneficial for y'all to see that. It's a very awesome little table I found a few years ago. Awesome, next slide, please. There we go. So some other waiver services include transportation, residential services, equine therapy, day rehabilitation, and nursing. Um, some examples of this is HCS, for instance. A lot of people like HCS because it does offer so many supports to keep the individual in the community. Um, I have clients who are, or who are elderly, who have no family left, and this waiver has allowed them to live completely independently in the community for many years with supports. Um, it does offer transportation to um, office visits, medical appointments, to day hab, to meetings. Um, HCS offers uh, residential services such as qualifying for group homes with large, low, uh, smaller sizes, so maybe three to four residents versus six in a normal Medicaid group home. Um, they can also qualify for host home through HCS where they can actually be like an adult foster in their family's home or an, an individual they know and pay rent to them that way. That's kind of a nice thing a lot of people like, and HCS offers that. 
Um, HCS does not op offer equine therapy, class would offer that. Um, and then another thing a lot of my clients love is Dayhab is covered through HCS. And I've had individuals who are on the HCS waiver who can get five days a week covered. So they do not have to pay for that out of pocket. And their provider who provides their HCS services is required to transport to them to their um, day half hours as well. Now, one of the things that is ongoing and a lot of the parent, the special need parent groups that I'm in um, is that the, the families that are getting waivers for the last couple of years, they've been really having um, serious staffing issues for nursing hours because there's a, a nursing shortage and, and a lot of the providers are short staffed as well. Um, and mm -hmm. so that is something if you are, if you are actually getting a wa waiver and you're having that issue, um, certainly you are definitely not alone in, the, in that regard right now. Totally true. I and mean, thank you for saying that. That is true. Obviously with COVID, it's put a lot of issues around things. I have seen that HCS providers have struggled a lot lately, especially due to the cost um, to hire people. They, they do have a low pay rate for attendant care and um, people who live in the group homes. So a lot of them have been struggling to keep staff lately with the pandemic. Um, and the state has not increased the wages for these uh, people who work in these group homes in many years. So obviously I live in Austin. Austin is one of the most, least affordable cities in Texas. So it is very hard for staff to get hired in this city because they can't afford the rent that they need to live here. And so that is a common factor for many of these waivers as well. So, and uh, I did see someone say about the survey. I have sent it into the chat box. I'm gonna put it again, just so y'all have it. Um, feel free to take it. And I can send it again at the end to everyone as well. Um, Caleb, we can put that out in the email to everybody um, following that. So if you just send that over to me, we'll put that in the email. Um, so that way they can, they can, it can be a clickable link from the email okay. as well. That works great. Thank you for that. So the next thing is waiver general eligibility. Most waivers are for all ages except for MDCP and STAR Plus or Medically Dependent Child Program. Um, they are the exceptions. Financial eligibility for all waivers except for Texas Home and Living is within 300% of SSI monthly amount, which is would be 2,523. Um, this does not look at parental income. That is also why it's called a waiver. Um, individuals must meet the functional eligibility uh, criteria for the specific waiver. And note, eligibility is not determined until an individual comes to the top of the wait list. So like we said, if you even feel maybe your kid's five and you think maybe they have autism or they, you know they have Down syndrome, go ahead and get them added to the wait list now so that by the time they get to maybe 20, 25, they're already getting services. Um, you might as well do it. If you think so, just go ahead and do it. Um, if it turns out they don't, that's fine. They'll just, we'll skip them and they won't qualify for that waiver. So definitely as soon as you know, do it. Well, and, and, you know, there, you know, the thing is, is like, we, we just, and, and you don't know, like, so if you have a, a toddler with, you know, some short delays, little delays, you're not sure yet, you have a premature baby, you can put them on the list. It, right. it doesn't cost you anything to put them on the list. And then you're kind of starting that process. And, and if you need it, great. 15 to 17 years, you might get it. And if you don't, that's okay. There's no penalty for that, for sure. Exactly. And I just wanted to say too, just, I know someone said this earlier, definitely keep updated with your local authority. Every county in Texas has a local authority. If you do move counties, let them know who you are, change your address on the waiver so that it follows you. I have had individuals who've left counties and their name was called up in that county and they didn't update their address. So they actually got skipped. So definitely wherever you go, whatever county in Texas, definitely update that information for them. So and, and phone numbers, phone numbers and email address, not just the, the address. And right. then don't worry, we're going to tell you all about your local authority, who they are, how to find them out, how to find out who the new one is. If you're changing counties, uh, that's coming up in just a minute. Definitely. We'll go through all that good stuff. Um, so the next thing is two funding pathways for waivers. Um, the first one is interest list. Also, you've heard me call it a wait list a lot. Um, this is a first come first serve and it's statewide and you can wait as long as 14 years. Like we said, there's kind of varying times. It kind of just depends um, and that could change in the future. Um, the next thing is promoting independence and it prevents or diverts individuals from institutions and addresses crisis. Um, this helps individuals who uh, move away from and transition from institutions as well. And we're gonna cover that on the next slide as to how um, one might divert or get out of an institution for these waivers too. Is that slide showing up on your end? There it goes. Yes, it just went through. Okay. Perfect. So, yes. I think you have a delay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah, there's a little bit of one. 
Um, the next thing is the wait lists. And this is where we were going to talk about the LIDAs, right? LIDA, lead, uh, LIDA, whatever you want to call it. Um, so the first one is for the medically dependent child class and death blind multiple disability programs. You'll call this 1-800 number. Case managers can call for people. Teachers can call for students. Parents can call. The individual can call. I've called for people. It's just a person who answers in a phone line. They put the information in the computer. You're good to go. So I would definitely recommend that if you would like any of those. Um, the next one is health communities or HCS, Texas Home and Living and CFC. You will contact your local intellectual or developmental disability authority, LIDA, for Austin, Travis County, that will be Interval Care, Williamson County and some of the other ones are Blue Bonnet Trails, Hayes is Hill Country, um, so it just depends on where you're at. Um, you'll contact Wait, and we've got and Harris find... County for Houston, Harris County for Houston, um, Texana for Fort Bend, and then yeah. um, Jan put Galveston in there. Um, I was I, I don't remember it. I Gulf Coast. Gulf Coast is the the lid of for, yes. for 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 Galveston um, Galveston County. But the bottom line is is we're going to send you this slide and this little um, this link right here. Um, you can just put that in your browser and it's going to take you um, to a site. And all you do is you plug in your zip code and it's going to tell you who all of your services are for for your for your area. Now, the biggest thing that I want to talk about on this slide is every week people come to us and they say, oh, we're on all the lists. Mm -hmm. I called, I called my LIDA and we're on all the lists. And the answer is no, you're not. So if you called your LIDA, you're on the HCS, Texas Home Living, you know, you're on these lists, but class and MDCP and the D DBMD, there's a different wait list for that. Star Plus is a different wait list. So you want to make sure you are on the list. Now, another thing that I want to tell you that is, I, I find it silly, um, but it is the way that it is in the state of Texas. Um, there is no like website. You can't like just create a username and password and set yourself on the list and do that. I don't know why we haven't like moved to this. It seems like it would make so much sense and so much less stress for the, for the litis anyway. Um, but you do have to call your, your, your local authority. And that is where you're going to also find out um, where you are on the list. So if you're wondering if you've been on the list for many years and you're wondering where you are on the list, you call your local authority, you, you talk to them, you leave them a message letting them know that you would like to know where things stand and where you are on the list. That is also something that you don't necessarily see without calling. They're supposed to um, call you every two years, reach out to you, maybe by email, maybe by phone, verifying that you still want to be on the list, that none of your information has changed. Um, some local authorities have done a really great job of that over the last two years with the pandemic. Others have um, struggled and you know, they've had people out with COVID. They've been had staffing issues and things like that. So just put that on your, your calendar that if you haven't heard from them, that you're going to reach out to them so you don't get removed from that from that waiting list. And so, yes, Jan, um, Jan Davies did say Gulf Coast Center is the, the local authority for, for Galveston. There's multiple uh, local authorities. I mean, again, obviously it's, it's really by county, so it's all over the place, right? Um, you know, and, and typically when we have people on these webinars, we have people from all over the state, but this, this link right here is gonna help you find your exact one if you do not already know. But this is the biggest thing that you need to know. If you need to know how do I get on the list, this is your page. If you need to know where do I stand on the list, this is your page. And if you didn't even know what a local intellectual disability authority was until today, this is your page and you can um, find out exactly who yours is. And again, your local authority, um, they'll, you know, they'll plug your child in, they'll ask for some information and things like that, but then your, then your child is in their system. And then if there's testing that is needed and we're talking about the level of need and some of the other things that we were talking about earlier, uh, they can, um, they can advise you what um, services or resources might be available in your area that will be appropriate for your loved ones. Totally. And I do like to, as a case manager, I do like to recommend uh, getting in with the local authority anyway, especially on their IDD side. Um, a lot of times they do offer free case management or some kind of general services based. I know here in Austin, Integral Care has case management. They maybe cover a day or two of day hab. Um, and I think that's a big part is they are the local authority, so they can really help you out and have a lot of power. Um, another thing too is from my understanding, local authorities may also be able to expedite certain things like Medicaid paperwork to the office and get it done quicker in a faster time frame than if you were to generally submit it. So definitely get in with your local authority. They definitely are helpful. If you're in Travis County, Carla Atkins from Integral Care is our direct number to that. And I can send that out as well. 
Um, and then I know she said the last number on there was for star plus. So you do have to call for a different number for star plus versus class in them as well. So thank you for that. So the next thing we're going to talk about is promoting independence. And these are the two ways to skip the wait list for the HCS or um, class wait list, or I think it's HCS, sorry, HCS crisis diversion. Um, the first one is crisis diversion. So if you or your loved one is in crisis, you can contact your LIDA and tell them you would like to request an HCS crisis diversion slot or waiver. Um, the LIDA will help you with this process and make sure you are involved in the process as well. Um, I have seen a few people get this slot. Um, from my understanding, they do have to be in crisis. So whether it be like at risk of involvement with law, eloping, harm to themselves or others. Um, really, they have to be in crisis to qualify for this. It doesn't, it's not quick. It can take some time. A, a board of doctors has to approve it. And it's, it's a long process sometimes. If an individual already has Medicaid, it is a lot quicker. If a person does not have Medicaid, they have to qualify for Medicaid before they can even get this crisis diversion. Um, I've been working with an individual for the last two years who's been in the process for almost two years of getting this finalized to get through. But if you have it, it's quicker. So that's for the I, I, would, I would like to say that I've had two families in the last year that got the crisis diversion slots and they actually went very quick. Um, it wasn't perfect, but I mean, it, it went very quick. I mean, we're talking weeks um, and maybe two months as opposed to, to years. And so what I would say, so where do you start? So, you know, like he said, um, you know, a threat to themselves or others, you know, self-harm, suicidal, other things where basically they're at risk of being placed outside of the home because the person can no longer um, care for them. There are other reasons that crisis diversions happen. It could be the death of a caregiver, death of one parent that was providing caregiving services, or maybe one parent dies and the other parent has to go back to work because of that crisis. Um, so right. we've seen some we've seen some examples like that. I've seen where a grandparent was, you know, guardian had guardianship of the grandson and grandma died. Grandma was the caregiver. Grandpa was working. Grandpa continues to need to work. Um, but the, the 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 adult kid had high levels of need, um, very um, aggressive. So aggression is a is a big one, uh, that big threat to themselves or others. Um, so those are all reasons. So, so where do you start if you need a crisis diversion slot? Um, so I like to give examples on that, but you start with your local authority, your local intellectual disability. Um, you may or may not have success there. Um, we have also had success at re re referring people to the ARC of, of, of Texas. Um, they have had some success. And then there is a um, not-for-profit organization in the state of Texas in Austin called Every Child. And um, they have also been, they were actually involved with uh, the two that, um, that I know that got the crisis uh, in the last crisis diversion slot in the last year. They were very, very helpful. Um, they're based in Austin, but they have boots on the ground in every major um, kind of metropolis area in the state of Texas so that you can, even if if you live in a remote outlying area in Texas, you they do have uh, liaisons in your area. And so you can reach out to us, you can reach out to the ARC, you can reach out to your local authority and we can help you with that if you're in that situation. Definitely. And from what I've seen, and um, I know someone asked about local authority. So local intellectual authority is pretty much like the liaison, but like a nonprofit agency that works with the state to help kind of manage these services, specifically for HCS um, and intellectual disability services. Many have a mental health side as well. Um, and that's correct. Yeah, like I've had people who come into integral care to get an IDD intake and they've mentioned what's going on then and then there was able to have a crisis diversion set up and going forward. And it can be really quick. Um, I've also seen someone who called Disability Rights Texas and they were able to somehow kind of get it started as well. So there's many routes to get that done. Um, and the last one on that. I just wanted to mention here that this website that I was talking about to find out who your local authority is. Again, you're going to get this. You're going to get the slide, um, the slide deck. So you can click on it. You're going to put your zip code in. It's going to tell you who your local authority is. It's going to tell you what their phone number is. It's going to tell you their address. It's going to tell you the crisis line. All of them have crisis lines if, if you're in crisis. So if you're wondering about that, that, that little thing where you're going to put your zip code in, it, it's going to tell you all every bit of the information that you need for your local authority. And then you can click the link and go straight to their website. Exactly. 
The good thing with the local authorities is that they'll do an evaluation of the individual. So they'll do a full scale IQ test and that's that can be used to qualify them for this as well. And so I've had clients who come in who maybe don't have a diagnosis or an eval done and they'll get it done that way. And then it shows they do have an IQ below of a certain point and then they can qualify to move forward. Um, the last one that was on there too that I wanted to mention was PASAR. I have seen this take place a few times. Um, this is usually for the individuals who are at risk of being institutionalized. Um, I had a client who had to end up in a nursing home due to needs, but because they had a disability they qualified for PASAR to jump the list and they got HCS and were able to move out of the nursing home and move into a group home with supports in the community. And the idea is that people with disabilities do not belong in facilities like that. So it's a place to allow them to go into the community and thrive and not just be in one place in the most restrictive environment. Because that's something we try to push for in Texas a lot and across the country is the least restrictive environment for people with disabilities and a facility is the most restrictive. So we definitely want to put them out in the community. So. So we have a, a good question. Does a person have to be a citizen or a green card holder? We have a friend who just moved from overseas with a child with Down syndrome. Um, so what is this? Do you know the status on that? I actually do not know the answer. I know it for Medicare, and uh, but not for necessarily for Medicaid. I believe they do have to have citizenship to get at least the waivers. Um, they may qualify for general supports. Like I know I keep bringing up Travis County. That's just where I happen to live. So I'm more familiar with it. For Travis County specifically, I've had individuals who didn't qualify for waivers or Medicaid maybe, but they got general revenue for integral care, or maybe they qualified for one of the lighter things they offered. Um, but yeah, you do, I believe, have to be a citizen to qualify for it. So. Okay, perfect. So um, so we're going to switch gears on, you know, how do we get started with special needs planning and um, consolidated planning group or a holistic special needs planning firm. And and so if you've um, joined our webinars in the past, uh, of course, we're glad you're back. Um, but we really um, put out a lot of educational webinars on a, on a weekly basis um, to empower parents and give them the tools and the resources that they need to be able to kind of navigate some of these um, uh, these waters that can be confusing um, when when we have kids that are transitioning or maybe have already transitioned into adulthood. But getting started with special needs planning, um, you know, we want you to work with a special needs planner to help you formulate your plan. And a lot of the questions that we get on a pretty regular basis are what is the difference between a special needs planner and a regular planner? Um, special needs planners, we're, we're nationally certified as social security advisors. We're members of the special needs um, planning academy. And these all, all these things matter to be, being nuanced and special needs. Um, because when it comes to benefits, benefits such as SSI and Medicaid and some of these things that we've been talking about today, it's all about having money in the right buckets to make sure that you maintain your eligibility for these programs. Every single one of these waivers require Medicaid eligibility. So um, failing to qualify for Medicaid um, could cause you not to be eligible for a waiver when you come up on that interest list. So anyway, we have all of the same licenses that other advisors do. We just have additional certifications in our primary practice and focus is special needs families. The difference between us and a special needs attorney, we like to say we're the money, the money, the funding, money in the right buckets, making sure if we have a child that needs care for the rest of their life, not just yours, that there's going to be enough money for them. Okay. Um, we're able to determine future care cost estimates. We're able to do all kinds of forecasting, social security analysis. We have specialized software and things like that for that. But the special needs attorney, they're the paper, they're the legal documents, they're the guardianship, power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney, will, special needs trust, third party special needs trust, first party special needs trust. And the, the question is, is who do I need? You need both. Okay. So they refer to us, we refer to them. And, um, and once we, either one of us sit down and look at your situation, then we kind of know what the next steps are. But as far as getting started, you gather all the necessary planning documents. These are going to be um, all of the accounts that you have set up, life insurance, um, health insurance, disability, long-term care, any kind of coverage that you have through your work or through your group plans. This can be your statements, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, brokerage statements, bank statements. Um, this is going to be your legal documents, wills or trusts that you may already have in place. This is going to be a, um, your social security statements and your full earnings record downloaded from um, ssa.gov. In case you don't know, social security statements haven't been mailed in a really, really long time. Uh, they, you have to download them now from the Social Security Administration website, and you can create a username and password for free, and then um, you can download that. We, we talked to people about... Right Sorry, well, sure. someone, question. someone asked, where can they find special needs planners? Is there a place they can go to find that? 
Yeah, you can find that um, through um, looking up the, the Special Needs Planners Academy, uh, the Academy of Special Needs Planners. Um, there's very few, okay? So that is, there is an issue. <laughs> there, there is an issue. There's very few people that are nuanced in special needs, and that's why we're so crazy busy all, of the, all the time um, because most advisors don't deal in special needs at all unless they have, um, you know, a family member with special needs or something like that. They usually have a personal connection. So even across the country, across Texas and across the country in general, I mean, there, there, there's not, there's not many, but the, the Academy for Special Needs Planners is a good place to start for both attorneys and for advisors that do that. Um, so as far as developing a letter of intent, we refer to this as a family love letter. Um, what we say here is it's important to um, make sure that your wishes are known, the daily care, the daily routine of your loved one, if they can't communicate for themselves. Um, as parents, we have forgot more than anybody will ever know as, the, as to the overall care needs for our kids. And a letter of intent is going to communicate that. So if in the future you cannot communicate or you're no longer here, somebody else that would be stepping into your shoes could pick up this document and understand what is going right, what is going wrong, where, where, where were they born? What county were they born? Um, you know, what are the religious preferences? What are the di medical diagnoses? What are the meds? What are the allergies? Who are the doctors? What schools have they attended? What are your wishes? It, it's, it's very comprehensive. We have an entire webinar um, on a letter of intent, and we have a template um, that we um, have uh, for our clients of this as well. You can create one your own. You can download one from the internet, but I do recommend that it is not handwritten, that it is actually typed so that way you can edit it a couple of times a year. Um, think about your vision and how you hope things will look for your special needs child, but as importantly, how you hope things will um, look for yourself uh, in the future as well. Because so often as parents, what we're doing is looking at our kids and their care needs and we're not looking at the fact that after working for 25 or 35 years ourselves, that we might need some respite ourselves in retirement. So when we have kids that are going to need care for the rest of their life, um, you know, that, that, that situation may look a little bit bleak. So there needs to be some balance um, in there as you're planning. And we, we help plan for that. We help, you know, we help put dollars and cents in place. We help build those things out. And then the main thing is, is, is planning and having that vision and putting those things in place and not waiting, you know, till you're 80 or 85 years old and saying, Hey, I'm not getting any younger. I don't feel as good as I used to. I need a little bit of help. And we actually have had calls like that. Um, every year we get a call like that of like, I realize that I'm not going to be here forever and I don't have anybody else to care for my full care child. Um, so, so we want to prevent some of the things like that. Do we have some questions, Caleb? Yes, we did have one. Someone else asked, can they have both an attorney and a special needs planner? I, I'm sorry, do you need a special needs attorney and a special needs planner? Yeah, they yes. asked if they can have both an attorney and a special needs planner, or do those equal the same? Or No, they don't equal the same, and I, I'm glad you brought that up. They're not the same, and you need both. Um, you can and you should have both, because the, the planner is the money and the money in the right buckets, and the attorney is the paper and the legal documents. So a special needs planner doesn't is not an attorney and they don't do the legal documents. They're fully aware of what legal documents you need and they make referrals and they'll tell you what you need. But the attorney is going to do those documents and the attorney is not the financial side. They're not the money in the right buckets. They're the legal documents. So when it comes to special needs, unfortunately, it is siloed. You, you don't get all in one. Um, as it relates to that. So that's a great question. Thank you for that. And the last one was, where can they get a template for letter of intent? You can email us and we'll have our contact information at the end of the, um, the presentation and, and we'll send you a copy of it. Um, so as far as how your child's care will be funded, we're not going to spend a huge amount of time. This is a big deal. Um, SSI and Social Security um, you know, so a lot of our kids don't qualify for, um, for SSI until they turn 18 because it's based off of our assets. Once the child turns 18, um, the means-based test is based off of your child's assets. So we're not going to want them to have more than $2,000 in their name in order for them to be eligible for SSI and Medicaid. So money in the right buckets, if you're thinking about things, one of the things that you need to know is if you want your child to be eligible for Medicaid, and SSI, no more than $2,000 in their name when they turn 18. 
if they have more than $2,000 in their name right now and you need to move some around, you can move it into an ABLE account. Legally, you can move it into an ABLE account for their, for their use. We can help people set up an ABLE account. Uh, you can also move it into a special needs trust. You can also spend it down for their care needs, okay? But what we don't do is hide the money. I always, I always bring that up. It's not, it's not a matter of hiding. They find it, they, they're going to know. But there are legitimate ways to spend down and to move things into the right appropriate accounts. Um, establishing a special needs trust for their future care is the best option. Um, the special needs trust can have an unlimited amount of money that will, can be funded now or it could be funded upon your death with life insurance proceeds. So we have, so basically on this um, slide here, we have entire presentations dedicated to each one of these topics, getting in the weeds with special needs trust, entire presentations on SSI and Medicaid and Social Security, Social Security disability, <laughs> excuse me, um, but most people are going to pay for their kids' care needs out of their current assets now while they're alive, just like you always have. And then um, their, their assets left over at death or life insurance proceeds will fund the, um, the special needs trust in the future. So, um, you know, our kids have care needs and it's in the, and the numbers are in the millions, right? It's depending on the age of your child. So we have to plan accordingly because it's like another bucket it's like a third retirement. If you're married, you've got husband and wife retirement. And if you've got a special needs child, then it's like a third retirement. And some of these families have two special needs kids. So, um, and we, you know, we can certainly help, help with that. I wanted to bring up a point able, too, if you're okay. Sure. With that. Um, something sure. else, the ARC of Texas actually offers a master pool trust for, dis, uh, for disability trust. So feel free to reach out to them too. Um, they are for the whole state, I believe, and they can help you manage the trust and kind of put it in the right place. And again, that's the ARC of Texas. We're the ARC of the capillary. We're the local chapter. And there is a local ARC in pretty much every major county in Texas, just so y'all know. And then there's the and that is um and then that is definitely the master pool trust so it, it's kind of a, a kind of a group trust um most of the families that we serve have individual trust not the group trust but there are options out there for you if that um individual trust is not the right fit for for you so um the able account this is a 529a uh you can contribute up to sixteen thousand dollars a year it just went up from 15 to sixteen thousand in 2022 an additional twelve thousand eight eighty if you're working um, for the ABLE account, the disability needed to start prior to age 26. And you want to keep under $100,000 in the ABLE account because if the, if the ABLE account balance goes over $100,000, then you will disqualify uh, for, um, for Medicaid. So again, um, as far as like this last slide is concerned, we really do on our YouTube channel, um, we have presentations on every single one of these topics. Every single month we have presentations on these topics so you can catch them. All of our um, presentations are recorded and then we do put them out on our YouTube channel later so you can check them out that way. Um, as always, if you are uh, what we call a serial attender of attending our webinars, we're glad, we're glad you're here, but we always have these things that should be on your special needs planning radar. Um, how to develop a special needs care plan. So if you're wondering how much is the future cost going to be for my loved one that has care needs for the rest of their life, uh, we can help you um, d determine that. We have, um, we have software that helps us with that. So these future care cost estimates today, we were talking about the state waivers and the interest list. Um, Understanding the difference between SSI and SSDI and RSDI, Retirement Survivors Disability Income, um, is really, really important. Um, our kids, uh, initially, when they turn 18, they qualify for SSI and Medicaid. When a parent, if their disability started prior to age 22, they can be eligible for childhood disability benefits under a parent's record, which essentially means that they can qualify for 50% of uh, of a parent social security or social security disability once the parent turns it on so in that example a lot of times these kids will flip over from ssi to rsdi um, they'll get a higher monthly payout um, and typically that higher monthly payout could kick them off of medicaid but there's something called a pickle amendment that allows them to keep the Medicaid. So anyway, just knowing about how all of that works. And again, we um, are nationally certified as, uh, as Social Security Advisors. We have a specialized software that actually tells people um, exactly how and when to pull the trigger 
on their social security to maximize the benefits for their entire household. So if we have a spouse that's drawing off of a spouse's record, if we have more than one special needs child in the household, our software puts it down all the way to dollars and cents in the exact age and month that you should pull the trigger on what it means to you. Um, the big thing that we talk about on a pretty regular basis is um, when your child turns 18, if you happen to be divorced and child support is um, going to continue post age 18, that child support does need to be redirected to a first party special needs trust. And if it's not, <coughs> excuse me, it is going to be counted um, two thirds, two thirds of the child support would be counted against them um, as income. It will be considered the child's income, your adult child's income for SSI, and it will reduce their SSI or make them not even eligible for SSI and Medicaid. That's a big hiccup um, that people don't know about and they find out the hard way. So that's a big deal. Um, we've already talked about ABLE accounts. As far as beneficiaries are concerned, um, don't ever name your, your special needs child directly um, as, a, as a beneficiary on any of the accounts that you that you have because that will um that will make them lose eligibility as well. So um so we want you to just, you know, as far as these other items that are on the list, guardianship, um power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney, when can you do guardianship, all of these things. These are all um, all webinars that are kind of living living on our YouTube channel that you can um, check out. So just to have these things on your radar and, and definitely check them out. Can you give um, me I the work name on a of YouTube channel, by the way? Someone asked for that name. Yes, it's coming. It, it is definitely coming. I'm going to um, do that in just one second. Um, I work on a collaborative team. Um, we're located in the Sugarland area. We serve people all across the United States, all across Texas. So it doesn't really matter um, what county you're in. And we're networked with uh, with attorneys and professionals all across the state, not just in our local area. So I always just like to put some um, pictures, some faces with some names uh, that you might be working with um, at Consolidated Planning Group. And having said that, um, our consultations are always free. Um, so if you have a unique situation that you want to run by us and want to talk to us about it, or you need a, uh, a social security analysis or a special care plan analysis or, you know, kind of cost estimate, we can help you with that. So you can take a picture of this QR code and that'll take you directly to a calendar link. If you want to schedule with us, you can schedule there. We've got our Facebook page and our YouTube channel that I've mentioned a couple of times. Everything's free on that YouTube channel. So you can subscribe to that and see. Um, I think there's over 125 webinars out there on special needs topics, and we're putting more out there every single week. Um, so if you miss one, they're always recorded. They always live out here. You can go back and, um, and check that out. So having said that, I think we're um, pretty close to the end of our time. Is there one or two more questions that we need to answer? I don't see anything yet, but someone thanked you. And then someone wanted to get a template sent, but I believe you want them to reach out to you for that template specifically, right? For the for, for the um the letter, yeah, the letter of intent, letter of intent. for sure. For mm -hmm. sure. And so we're gonna um we're gonna go ahead, Caleb, you're gonna send me an email with your um with your survey. Yeah. Um we're gonna send you guys the slides, we're gonna send you the recording, we're gonna send you um Caleb's survey. If you guys will take a moment to do that survey, that will help them with their funding. We appreciate it. Um thanks everyone for joining us today. It's been certainly a pleasure and thank you, Caleb, um, for partnering with us and we look forward to partnering with you again soon. Yes, thank you, Allison. And again, I appreciate everyone allowing us from the ARC to come here. If you are in Travis County, please feel free to reach out to me. Our, most of our services are county specific, but I'm we work closely with Consolidated Planning Group and we're happy to help where we can. So I hope you all have a great one and stay warm out there. I know tomorrow's going to get cold. So thanks. Take care. Yeah, thank you all. Bye.